Welcome to Entrepreneurs International Network, where entrepreneurs learn, network, and grow. I'm Roger Killen, the organizer. Today, Pevand Danish is training us on how to make four times our sales by connecting with our prospects' mindset. Pevand, I've got a couple of questions that will help us to get to know you personally. The sure. first question is this. Uh, what is the biggest challenge that you've ever had to overcome? Now, the biggest challenge is really the topic of today is sales. As is one that I've certainly cha been challenged throughout my life and one that I share with the street colleagues today, and it's sales. Sales, okay. Second question, what's the best piece of advice anyone has ever given you? Biggest advice, I'd say, told me that selling is something that we do for someone and not to someone. And when that really resonated with me and I started to thinking about that more and more, it really helped me develop a different mindset altogether. And that really where I think everything shifted for me. Okay. Yeah. Repeat that. Sales is something we do for someone and not to someone. Yes. Yeah. Sales is something we do for someone and not to someone. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought it uh, made it into a routine and uh, share with you what, uh, what I've learned. And uh, today it really brings everything into perspective of what's selling. Okay, well, that's a super quotable quote. Uh, participants, if you have any questions during Payland's talk, would you please type them into the chat? And I will then pose them to Payland in batches Oh, um, about every 10 minutes uh, during his talk. Uh, rest assured, you will get all your questions answered uh, by the end of his talk. Now, secondly, uh, you're going to be sent a link to the recording of this talk in a few hours. Uh, but I encourage you nevertheless to take notes because the very act of taking notes is going to increase the content that you absorb and sometimes it's by as much as 30%. Payland, are you ready to rock the stage? I am ready, Roger. Then the stage is all yours. Take it away. Thank you so much, Roger. And it's truly an honor to be here and presenting the VBN group and uh, something that I've always inspired to do. And it's really a passion of mine, not just sales, but mindset. And it, the two of them <laughs> really encompass together it brought me here. I want to share with you what I've learned and what I use in my practices, whether it be selling an entry level program that we may have, or even high ticket items. I use these, uh, uh, I don't wanna say techniques, but it's a series of uh, strategies to help make that sale complete. And it's all about mindset. You know, 95% of all our results is about mindset. And it's only 5% really is the strategy itself. My name is Pavin Dinesh, as Roger mentioned, and I'm the owner and founder of Ignited Future, where I truly believe all of us can have an ignited future if we have the right mindset of today. So let's go over just a quick outline of what we're gonna be discussing. First, we're gonna be discussing understanding what holds us back at times, how our marvelous mind works. And if in order for us to find out how we can uh, impact one's mindset, ourselves and our prospects, we need to understand how the mind works. Understanding where the breakdown of the sales process occurs at times, the, break, the sales process breaks down and we're not sure how it broke down, why it broke down, and we're gonna get into that. And how eventually is increase our conversion rate. And I have the six step process that I certainly don't wanna take any credit for and uh, it's been something I've been taught by and I use in my own practices. And I wanna share it with uh, you today. But before we go into the training, I just wanna give you a little bit of background on my, myself. You know, I. Graduated from uh, University of British Columbia here in Vancouver back in 2003. And things were really going well. I have a bachelor's degree in commerce with a major in logistics and minor in IT. I got out of university. I got a really great job with one of the largest corporations here in Canada. And things just went really well. I got hired into a management development program. And from there, I got hired into other companies. And things just went really well right up to on my late 20s, really. And late 20s is when 2008 hit. And at that point, things were still going really well for me at the beginning of 2008, where I bought, I bought my own house. 
started a family. My firstborn was with us and things. I just couldn't wait to go into my thirties because wow, like I was just so excited about what I've been able to accomplish in my twenties. I, I just wanted to see what I can accomplish in my thirties. So things just couldn't get any better. But of course, at the end of 2008, financial crisis hit. And I lost a very well-paying job, almost lost the, our home, lived off the line of credits and visa cards and all sorts of stuff to get us by. And you know, I like to say things turned around for me quick, but it didn't. You know, I got incremental changes and incremental improvements over the next eight years, but they weren't really significant to what I wanted. I was slowly making my way back to where I was but certainly not the magnitude that I wanted. And that caused me a lot of frustration. And I wanted to know why. Why is it that I can't, whereas other people in the same industry, market, sometimes selling the same market, selling the same product, were able to accomplish it. So what was I doing so differently? And it was only until I met my mentor now, Bob Proctor, who's I'm a consultant with, with him and his uh, empire, that we implement these strategies and help other entrepreneurs business men alike, to really make a quantum leap in their sales and make an impact uh, in their businesses. And over the last few years, I've really been able to triple my income. And I'm not trying to impress anyone here, but I want to impress upon you that the cover, what we're going to cover today really works. And if it works for me, it can work for anyone because I've had very little sales experience in my life. So I want you to, as Roger mentioned, you know, take notes, take notes, and review the video two, three times because when we think and how we think will impact how we feel and how we feel will impact how we act and how we act will ultimately determine our results. So take notes as much as you can. There is a recording of this that you can come back and watch over and over again, but the more you put pen to paper, the more you're gonna retain. So let's get started. Hey Len, before we start, would you like the first question? Sure. Uh, how do you balance doing what is right in the face of a pushy sales manager and the pressure of a quota? Uh, you know, I, I don't want, when you go through the sale process, as, we, if, uh, as I put it, we're doing something for someone. I never come into a position that I want to forcefully sell it. Ultimately, I want the prospect or the client to actually sell themselves into the product and service that we want. And that's the ultimate gain. So my philosophy and what I and how I condone myself with prospects and is never a pushy salesperson. I don't strive to be that person. And how you balance that if you are that person is, personally, I believe it's going to be a short-term uh, career because ultimately it's going to come through. No further questions. Thank you. The first, really the first words that came out of Bob's mouth when I was talking to him, he said, Pavin, thoughts become things. And if you can see it in your mind, you will hold it in your hand. And if there's one thing I encourage you to, if you remember anything out of my presentation today, is this sentence, because everything starts from my thoughts. Everything starts from there. How we think about our clients, how we think about prospect, how we think about market, industry, products and services, right? it all starts there. And are we coming from a thought of limitations, lack of, or is it abundance and process? All comes from our thoughts. You know, and we are only limited by weakness of attention and poverty of imagination. What is weakness of attention? You know, weakness of attention is ultimately our focus. How are we into the goals and results that we want to attain? You know, the will, which is one of our mental faculties, one of six mental faculties we have, really helps us focus. And if you can focus on one thing, you can focus on many things. And I believe there's a, another workshop just in a couple of weeks on helping people with focus. I highly encourage you to be there as well. I'm gonna be there because we cannot learn enough on how to be focused enough. And then poverty imagination, you know, imagination. I love what Albert Einstein said. Albert Einstein said, logic will take us from point A to B, but imagination can take us anywhere. And Napoleon Hill, you know, he's one of my favorite authors, grab any of his books. You know, he said, imagination is the most marvelous, miraculous, inconceivably, the most powerful force that the world has ever known. And it's imagination. What is our imagination? What is it that we can create in our businesses, our sales, our goals? And these two are really the two quotes that drive me on a day-to-day -day basis. So let's talk about goals. And why is it important to even the sales process? Well, there's three types of goals that we work with. There's type A and type B. Type A goals are things that we already know how to do. Let's, for example, let's say last year we made 100K for, for the sales. Next year, we may strive to push ourselves a little bit and make 
5,000, 10,000, let's call it 5%, 10% more, right? Those are almost what we've already accomplished. We've already done that. We already know how to do another 5, 10%. Those are really quantum leaps. Type B goals are really things like a blueprint, I call it. You know, if we sit down and really put a lot of thought into it and we go from A to Z and do all the things in between, we'll accomplish that goal. The problem with type A, type B goals are frankly is not inspiring. It doesn't excite us, doesn't scare us because at the same time, it doesn't drive us. You know, it doesn't get our blood pumping. But type C goals are different. Type C goals are things that are in fantasy, something that we just want. We don't know how we're gonna get it, but we just want it. Now you might be thinking to yourself, well, if I can't, if I don't know how to get it, then what's the, word, what's, what's the point of going for it? Well, you know what? Type C goals are what drives us. It pushes us, it sets us, and scares us. And that's the goals that we want. Imagine instead of $100,000 that we made last year, 100K we made last year, in our sales, we target 500 this year. Different thinking process altogether to accomplish 500K. And the mindset of a person making 500K, I think we'd all agree, is completely different than that of a person that making 100K a year. And so on and so forth. So to learn, we need a certain degree of confidence, not too much, not too little. And if we have too little, we think we can't learn. And if we have too much, we think we don't, we, we don't need to learn. And I just wanna reiterate this because I was at the bottom end when I started this. And, I, and I'm not gonna say this stand here and tell you that you know, I've accomplished everything I want and you know, I wanna impress you and yada, yada. No, it's something like that. But if I can do it, I wanna reiterate, you can do it. What I've learned and what Bob's learned, and he's been doing this line of work for 60 years. Bob Proctor's been in the field of mindset and personal development for over 60 years. And that's why I've chosen to work with him because he is the person when he becomes attaining the results we want in life. So there's four powerful concepts for building our business. One is just being a professional. I think that goes back to the first question that, that was brought up. You know, ultimately what we wanna do is we wanna arrive being a professional regardless, regardless of what's happening at home, regardless of the troubles that we have, regardless of what's happening at the back of our mind, whether or not the sale is gonna go through. A lot of times you probably experience this yourself where a person's trying to uh, sell us a product or service and you know, break the ice. Most of the time they're complaining about, you know, back then when we traveled, it was about par traffic or parking or uh, these days about the internet and all that stuff that just comes up where you know, we're just not being professional. And I was watching um, The Last Dance by, uh, you know, it's a documentary of Jordan era, right? And this point drove like the nail to the coffin. It was we up regardless. He, he showed up in the court regardless of what was happening at home, what was happening with the media, his gambling news and all that stuff. He showed up because he knew people had invested a lot of money in watching him and he needed to perform. Why? Because he was a professional. Second is selling. And this is what one thing we're going to, one topic we're going to concentrate today is how do we lead another person in the path of agreement? It's not becoming a pushy person. It's not uh, how we want to sell them and get it to check and run off and they never find us again. No, it's about how do we approach it, lead them to the path of agreement, and we're there continuously, not just before the sale, but after the sale. Third is management. If anyone here on the call has a team, we all know the development of people is throughout my career, I've been very blessed to have been led lead over 500 individuals where I say really lead, not just manage because you know if we're managing someone, it's not gonna cut it. You know, you're managing their time, you're managing what, what's gonna happen. It doesn't really get us anywhere. But in order to really aspire and create abundance in your own businesses, if you have a sales team or if you have a number of people that you work with, developing the people around you is really ultimately going to give you the result. And fourth, certainly in psychology. You know, psychology, a lot of times I find, and what is psychology? Well, psychology is a study of mind and behavior in relation to a particular field of knowledge or activity. You know, and a lot of times I find we get hung up a lot on the facts and figures. How many clicks, how many numbers just showed up, how many 
how many X amount of clients I meet per week, transfers to X amount of results, X amount of sales, and so on and so forth. We become too hung up on the facts and figures, but really it's a psychology aspect of it that you can meet five people in one week and sell all five, or you can meet a hundred people and sell five. So it's a psychology of really understanding the behavior aspect of it. And there's only two reasons why anyone will buy anything. And if you look at your products and services that you're selling, it falls into either one of these two. It's either to gain a profit or avoid a loss. And since I love being on the positive note, we'll talk about to gain a profit. So to gain a profit, we as professional sales, we have to ask questions and actively listen. Now, a lot of times we get into a meeting and we are so quick to jump into the sales aspect. We're going to discuss why that's not really any, uh, doesn't help us get the sale that we want, but at the same time, it doesn't uh, really build that rapport. Allowing you see the world through the eyes of the client. This is exactly why we need to ask questions, listen carefully, and really find what it is that's keeping the client up at night. And does your product or service answer that call? Sometimes that person that you're meeting may not be really the client. It might be the 10 people that are behind them that are ultimately going to be your client. So we have to understand what is it that they want. And again, as I mentioned, we got to see what's important to one person, it may not be important to another either. So professional or effective communication, that's one of the things that we need to understand, being able to communicate or lack of it really hinders a person with it that's in the sales. So become a professional salesperson, we need to effectively communicate. And it's so essential, be able to know our product, know our services, know the market, know our own six steps that we're gonna go into into details on. So when it becomes a habit to help your prospect get what they want in life, the law will see that your customers will be the medium through which your good will be delivered to you. And that's the law, it's the law of cause and effect. And that ultimately is what I was mentioning earlier is this is something we do for someone, not to someone. When we do something for someone, we're helping them grow. We're helping them achieve what it is that they want to achieve by means of our products and services. So where does all this start? All of this start with our marvelous mind and your marvelous mind, because as a salesperson, you need to take control of the entire presentation. You need to lead them to the path of agreement. So as much as it is, we understand how the prospect mindset is or their, how their mind works, ultimately it's our mindset and our understanding of what we're capable of that's gonna determine the result. So this has nothing to do as much as it is the prospect's mindset, we understand it, but it is our mindset that's more important. Understanding and working in harmony with the laws that governs the mind is essential. So we need to understand how the mind works. So two things we need to know to achieve the success we want, where, where we are right now and where we wanna go. But yet, and this is so simple, right? But a lot of people get stuck at it. Why? Why is it that a lot of people at times get stuck? We know where we are, we know where we wanna go, but there's something that's kind of hindering my That's like me back in you know, 2008, 2009. I knew where I wanted to go. But I certainly was not achieving it at all. And it's because of paradigms. And we're going to get into what paradigms are. And I'm not sure if anyone's heard of what paradigms are, but we're going to get into the details of it, of how it impacts us and impacts us greatly in all aspects of our life. So paradigm. What's a paradigm? Paradigm is a mental program that has almost exclusive control over our habitual behavior. And almost all of our behavior is habitual. See, 95 to 96% of all our results, behavior and habits resides in the paradigm. Everything, almost like a programming. If you look at your phone, there's a certain programming that's in there. Some of it you're not even aware of. I'm certainly not aware of how much programming, you know, Apple puts in my phone, but there are all sorts of programming in the background that's working. And I don't know half of them. And it's the paradigm similar to a program in a, in a, um, cell phone that determines the results we're going to get. And these paradigms have been implanted in two ways, through our genes and through our environment over the course of the years. And we're going to get into how paradigms impact the sales strategy and how does this all work together. 
But right now, what I wanted to explain to you is how is the mindset set in terms of doing this? And this is where we start looking at the mindset. So we look at the mind and the paradigm. And your mind, like I mentioned, there's a problem, a, a definite problem because the mind itself, no one has seen before. So I'd like to do a quick exercise. And this exercise entails you closing your eyes. So if it's safe to do so, close your eyes now. And let's do this exercise together. So I'd like you to close your eyes and picture your kitchen. As you're in your kitchen, I'd like you to picture your refrigerator. Now, if your refrigerator is, what color is your refrigerator? Is it white? Is it black? Stainless steel? Is it a two door, a four door? Is it a French door? Now let's think of your car. What color is your car? Two door, is it a sedan? Is it an SUV? Is it electric? Now I want you to think of your mind. What does your mind look like in terms of getting results? What does that look like? Now you can open your eyes now. Now, if you were most people, most people, We'll think of the brain as the mind. See, the mind isn't the brain. Mind is movement, mind is entity. My finger is no more the mind than it is my brain. My brain is just the physical formation of it. And this is a problem that a doctor actually realized back in 1934. Dr. Thurman Fleet realized, he was in the healing arts and he realized if we're gonna cure people, we need to find out what this mind looks like. Now, if there are any psychologists on the call and someone sees this, there are many parts to the mind, I agree. But when it comes to results, this is exactly what the mind looks like in comparison to getting results. I'm going to share this with you. And this is how we're going to get into how all of this comes together and it helps us make that sale and conversion rate. So let's take a look at this. He drew a big circle and a circle at the bottom. He drew a line in the middle of it. He said, that's the conscious mind. And that bottom there is the subconscious mind. And the little circle at the bottom is the body. Now, first, we may have thought of it differently because certainly a lot of us, you know, the mind is the instrument of the body, but most realistically, the body should be the instrument of the mind. And that's what this depicts. And then he drew these five antennas. These are like five lane highways. We see, hear, smell, taste, and touch by our outside worlds. How we communicate to our clients is through the outside world into their conscious mind. Now, there are different variations of the, how the conscious mind, subconscious mind works. And let's get into that and how does it all come together in forming the sale. So conscious mind, what is the conscious mind? Now the conscious mind, we call this by the stick person, by the way, it's the thinking mind, it's the educated mind. Everything we learn in universities, everything you're learning here today, it's going in your conscious mind. Our six mental faculty of reason, imagination, perception, of the will, ability to focus, our memory, all of those reside in the conscious mind. It's the intellect. Now the subconscious mind, it's the emotional mind. Conscious mind, can, you can choose. You can accept or reject. You can choose. You can accept or reject what I'm mentioning to you today. You can say, nope, I don't believe a word this paid and guy is saying. And that's completely fine. And that's your conscious mind. Everything I'm sharing with you today is going directly in your conscious mind because you're not even delivered it to your subconscious mind yet. So you can choose to accept or reject. Emotional mind, though, is the main difference here. It can only accept. It cannot reject. It cannot tell the difference between right or wrong. It's almost like fertile garden. You know, you've got a garden on your hand with the subconscious mind. You can plant roses, a field of tulip, an oak tree, and two inches away, you can plant nightshade, which is a poison. And you'll get the same abundance as you did with all the others. Why? Because the subconscious mind doesn't know the right or wrong. Whatever you plant in it, you will get. So how we talk to our clients, how we talk to our prospects, looking at this stick person from our five sensory factors, our see, hear, smell, taste, and touch, taps into their conscious mind. Now we're gonna get into a little bit deeper in, into this. Well, how is it that sometimes a sale is made? Sometimes a sale isn't. And it's about this stick person how the mind works and how we're able to convert a sale or not. 
Now let's take a look at school, for example. And this is me. When I was frustrated back in 2008, when I lost my job in the financial crisis, I had all the knowledge. I had two degrees from a well-known university. I had a great job for years, making great money. I had the superior knowledge. I took all these programs after I, I lost my job and I just couldn't make it. So I had all these superior knowledge about the stock market, the logistics, IT, but I had no results. I had inferior results. And what did that do? That causes me a lot of confusion and frustration. Why? And look at the stick person again, because the conscious mind is where we hold everything we learn. And it certainly doesn't give us the results though. That doesn't give us the results. The paradigm gets us the result. So if we want to have a new result, we need to change the paradigm. This explains, this stick person, this stick person that we call explains why we'll have a high school graduate or a high school graduate or um, with honors and PhD and uh, go on, become a PhD in economics, PhD in finance, and we'll find them bankrupt on the streets, unfortunately. Why? Because they have superior knowledge, but no results. At the same time, you'll have a high school dropout becomes a millionaire. Why? Because it's not how much we know, it's what we do. And it's all about the paradigm. Now, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that, no, we don't need to know. Of course, I have many friends who are doctors, chiropractors, work in field of the surgery and all sorts. Yes, they need to have that knowledge, absolutely. So knowledge is critical, but it doesn't 100% guaranteed having the knowledge gets you the results. And I think we all can agree on that. And this sixth person explains that very well. It explains it clearly. Something that really impacts us as sales people in sales is our self-image. So we have two self-images. We have the self-image at the conscious level. We have a self-image at the subconscious level and they're two completely different. The self-image at the conscious level is how you're seeing me. I've got a jacket, a shirt, my hair, sunglasses, glasses, sorry, and all sorts. How you see me, how I walk, talk, if we were to meet, how I shake your hand. That's all the physical that we see. It's on the conscious mind. I am consciously aware of it and I act on it. Self-image at the subconscious level is how you see yourself, the programming that you see yourself. Ultimately, some of the, the confidence that you might have. And when no one else is around you, how do you, uh, what are the thought process you have at the conscious mind about your own self-image? Do we have an image of doubt, fear at the conscious level that I'm going to make that big sale or I'm not going to make it. This is going to go well. It's not going to go well. And therefore creates fear at the subconscious level. And our self-image is critically important in helping us achieve great results. Something else that's also of importance is a word called praxis. I'm not sure if anyone here has heard the word praxis before, but praxis is the integration of the belief at the conscious level and the subconscious level. You know, before any of this information I learned, you know, back, go back to 2008 again. Lost my job. Somebody was asking, Pavin, you know, what are you going to do in a couple of years? I'm going to make it great. I'm just going to hit it out of the ballpark because you know what? I was able to do it in my 20s. Wait till we see what I do in my 30s. I believed it at the conscious level. I really did. But if you actually followed me, for a few weeks back then, you realize in no shape or form am I behaving or believing at the subconscious level that I am that person. I certainly didn't behave that way. I didn't believe it at that, to a subconscious level and therefore I didn't act that way. So the belief at the conscious level and the subconscious level is critically important to someone making the sales. Why? Because we can consciously say, I'll become a millionaire. I'm gonna get my sales this month or next year, this quarter, I'm gonna make my quota. But if we're not acting, behaving at a subconscious level, it's the paradigm. We're not going to get it. So here's a few examples of some things that a paradigm controls. Paradigm controls our perception. How you perceive the world essentially is going to dictate your results. You know, perfect example is back in 2008 financial crisis again. People were making millions of dollars back then at the same time in the same market, same industry, same arena. People were losing their jobs and weren't able to cut it. Why was their perception, right? Everything, the financial crisis was just over. Now, pandemic, COVID. There are people just in the same 
same field market that they're in selling the same products and services are just hitting home runs every day. Same person, literally could be the next door in the same desk and office, frankly, and they're just not making it. Why? It's their perception. Use of time. Have you noticed some people like, they, we all have 24 hours, right? But you know, have you seen some people that just, it feels like they have another 24 hours. How do they get all this work done? It's their paradigm. Paradigm controls how we use our time, believe it or not. Our creativity, our effectiveness, and our productivity as a whole is all controlled by this paradigm that's at the subconscious level. And because it's at the subconscious level, it's not easily changed. And it impacts us in sales, our logic. Logic is almost like an invisible ceiling where it impacts, again, how we behave at the... Our ability to earn, therefore, encompassing all these variables drives the paradigm forward. And we are boxed in. And until we literally release ourselves from this box, we're not going to uh, push further. Someone that's making $50,000 a year will most likely make 50 little bit here and there difference for most part, unless they make a shift in their paradigm. Now, obviously a lot of people do that without even knowing what paradigm is, but because that's because they're an unconscious competent. You see a lot of people just making great sales, great income, great how, what life that they have. It doesn't have to mean that they know what paradigms are, but they're able to shift that paradigm without even knowing it. So they're an unconscious competent. Now, we never change things by fighting the existing reality. So the current paradigm that we have, the current sales strategy that we can, we can never change it by fighting this. It's, it's, uh, it's redundant. So to change something, we build a new model that simply makes the old model obsolete. Now let's get into the stick person and how these two really work together. So when we're sitting in front of someone, a client, a prospect, we are at consciously communicating by words and gestures and writing. But then there's a subconscious level that they're feeling of how confident we might be on how we are thinking of the sale. If we're sitting there, for example, thinking that telling the client that I wanna help you, but deep down, I just, I'm thinking I need the sale for the mortgage. I need the sale for the visa card. I need the sale because I need to pay my line of credit. They're gonna feel it. They're not gonna know what they're feeling, but they are gonna feel something. And that slight edge that they're not gonna, they're gonna be ambiguity. There's gonna be different levels of vibration coming to them. Our words are telling them something. They're feeling something else. And they're not gonna make the sale. So the professional salesperson, and these are the six steps we wanna follow. We want to put this into memory. Put it into memory because it works. Now, step one is attention. Okay. So first things first of all, we want to get their attention. A lot of times we get into a meeting and we think, oh, they're ready for us. Oh, they're actually, you know what? This person has been anxiously awaiting how I'm going to change their world by, by product or service. But you know what? They had 10, 20, 30 different things on their mind and they're not even thinking of what we're selling. So the first thing what we need to do is we actually need to get them to stop thinking. Stop thinking of all the stuff that we're thinking about. Maybe they just got off on a really bad call. Maybe they had some bad news from spouse. Maybe they didn't make the sale that they wanted. Now that's impacting your meeting. So the first thing we need to do is grab their attention and get them to stop thinking. And the way we do that and by probing and asking them certain questions to get them to see how we're interested to them. These are just simple questions. And it's ultimately a lot of times overlooked. So we ask questions about, how are you doing? Where are you from? How did you get into this business? Why did you get into this business? How is your business doing? Simple questions will stop them to think of whatever they were thinking and get them, get the, your attention to them. Second step is interest. Hey, Van, uh, yeah. a question about step one. Uh, sure. How do you know? How, how do you know how to read the prospect such that you're asking a question that that is actually important and engaging and resonates with your prospect? It's a really good question. So, first step one, when we're just getting their attention. It's all about them. 
has nothing to do with us, has nothing to do with our product and services. The first phase of attention, you just want the prospect or client to talk about them. And you'll know right off the bat if they're interested in talking to you because at the beginning, we just want them to talk about them. That's the first step is get their attention. We don't mention anything about our product or service. We don't mention anything about who even we are. All we say is, hey, thank you for joining me today. You know, one of the first the comments I always say is, let's say I'm meeting someone by the name of Jeff. I say, hi, Jeff. I really appreciate you spending some time today with me. I've been really looking forward to our meeting. How are you today? And then I ask them questions about their business. What are they doing? Because remember what I said at the beginning? Selling is something we do for someone, not to someone. So if I have the mindset of, I want to help this person, then why am I getting into getting involved right away about my business and services? Let me find out more about them. What is their business? So you get their attention. Everybody wants to talk about themselves. Everybody. I haven't met a single person that as soon as you find out uh, where they're from, what kind of line they work, they don't answer you. And if they don't answer you, then frankly, you know what? <laughs> that means it's not going to go well. You might as well just quit right there because that person is not interested for whatever reason. So that, that attention... Uh, we don't mention anything about our business, products, services, nothing like that. Hope that answers that question. No further questions. Thank you. Interest. So interest, you know, you may have heard this one before, but MMFI, make me feel important, right? Make that person feel important. Make them feel important. This part entails us being interesting to what they want and creating an environment through questions. So now this is more questions about finding out what it is that their problem is. What's keeping them up at night? We're diving in deeper to see, do, do they even want our product and services, right? You get their interest after you become consciously interested in their wants. We can't help our clients if we don't get consciously or subconsciously involved in what they want. So we need to get genuinely involved in their interest. And again, remember the conscious mind, subconscious mind. The subconscious mind cannot lie. If, if, you're, if I'm telling Roger that, Roger, I want to help you, and I actually feel, you know what, I just want to take advantage of this, whatever it is, Roger's going to feel it. He is. He may not know what it's easily feeling, but his subconscious mind, my subconscious mind, the fact that I'm lying to him, he's going to feel it. And it's going to set a bad rapport. So we need to genuinely get involved in this, what it is that person wants and does our products or service help them? So all of this done is to them a series of questions of who, what, when, where, why, how. All these questions are probing and finding the person what they want. And it's through these questions that we're ultimately leading the person to the path of agreement. Ultimately, clients selling themselves for the product and service we want to, for them to buy. We're not being pushy salespeople. We're just leading them to the path of agreement. So they buy our products and services. They're literally giving us their credit card, signing the check before sometimes we even ask for it. So if the process is hearing one word, I want to help you, and we're thinking of something else, it's not going to mesh. They're going to understand it. They're going to know. And this is what the stick person kind of tell, tells. I want to put this drawing on so we see this because we're telling them at the conscious level, I want to help you. But at the subconscious level, I'm just thinking, I want the sale. And they're going to feel it. They're going to feel that negative vibration. But if I'm thinking that I do really want to help you, and at the subconscious level, I do want to help people. I truly want to help everyone on this call. And I think everyone here on this call feels it. Why? Because I do. I really want to help everyone succeed and make a quantum leap in their sales this year. Double, triple your sales this year. And I really do. And I think you feel that because that's how I feel. I want to help you. But if I'm thinking, oh, you know what? I'm just going to make this presentation. I just hope, uh, and I'm going to sell something and I'm just going to run off and they're never going to see me again. You'll feel that too. Two questions, Payland. Maggie sure. wants to know, do you have any tips to keep clients' attention and engage them, but also not run over on your consultation time? Mm. Very good question. Very good question. Um, the so let's suppose uh, I'm going to assume that you know Maggie. Let's, let's suppose you have a 30 minute consult. It's I uh, based on the product or services you're selling. I divide only two to three questions at a time. And I and these steps that we're following. It's really you want to jump from one to another. 
So I have preset questions already laid down for myself, how I'm gonna go through the consulting session. And as we go from one to another, I jump along. Now if, the con now, if the person wants to go back and forth, it is really up to you to bring them back in through your series of questions. So the questions that you the set up for each step of the way, you know, we have questions for step one, step two, step three, and so forth, all the way down to six, we have certain questions set up. And as soon as the client is moving away from that, we wanna bring our questions in and gear them to the, the, the step that's involved. Um, they may, they may at times uh, feel that, you, why are you interrupting me or why are you, uh, you know, speaking over me? And ultimately, I always bring back the fact that we're very touched in time. I don't want to take too much of your time. And because of that, is it okay if we proceed? This is what I really wanted to cover with you. Um, and most of the time, I'd say most, but I say really most of the time, people resonate with that and they don't have an issue because everyone's respectful of each other's times. Uh, second question is my question. Mm -hmm. uh, it's all very well to say, have the intention of uh, doing what's right for the customer and mm -hmm. have the intention of uh, uh, asking uh, open-ended questions. But, but in, the, in, in, a, in a busy day-to-day -day life, sometimes intention, good intentions go out the window. My question is this. Do you have a ritual that forces you to uh, that forces you to ask yourself before, during every sales call, uh, certain things that force the do right by the customer philosophy into the front and center of your conscious and unconscious minds. Mm -hmm. So I think if I'm understanding this, you're you're wondering. <clears throat> How can we, at the same time, be truthful to ourselves and truthful to the customer while making making a sale? It's really be how how do we make re, remain truthful to the customer? Mm -hmm. Okay, truthful. At the end of the day, personally, I always find does our product and service help them? If we believe, because you know, as we're going through these steps, we are tapping into something into their subconscious mind. So when you tap into someone's subconscious mind, you are building a very, very heavy rapport. You're building trust with them. I never take that for granted. When we talk to a client and create that trust, it cannot take an advantage of. And it's at that point that whatever I promised, I must deliver. And a lot of times we find there are great sales people out there that promise the world they have to deliver what they told us. And that, you know, whatever we want to call it, a con man or someone that's just taken advantage of the situation. And that's what I find. Thank you. Wow. And this is where really what we're talking about when it comes to desire. Desire is we must get the prospect to want what we have. It's not about the need. No one really buy something they need. They buy what's something they want. We need to create that want through our series of questions that we formulate. And how we create desire is bringing their future self to the present. So explaining and creating that emotional impact, like the subconscious mind, we mentioned the subconscious mind is the emotional mind, creating that emotional impact for the customer how is it going to benefit them? How is this product or service going to benefit them in the future? And bringing that into the present tense and making the client prospect feel it and allowing them to feel it for a moment. And as we do that, that creates the desire. That's when people say, yeah, that's what I want. Yeah, yeah you, you know, whatever you told me, if that's what's going to help create my future self, that's what I want. Yeah, I want this product, I want this service, because I trust you, I believe it. And if we take, if we go through the steps of uh, the stake person, what happened? We first formulated questions through our five sensory factors. We tapped into their conscious mind, see, hear, smell, taste, and touch. So we tapped into their conscious mind. And when we went through their conscious mind, what happened? 
they agreed to what we were talking to them. They agreed that our product or service is of value. It could help them. They still haven't made a decision if this is going to uh, answer all their troubles. But once we actually made the emotional impact and created that desire of their future self and brought it to the present, that's when they're going to trust us. That's when they're going to make the sale. And a lot of times, people that are on this call, you probably found a lot of times in the past when all the sales that you've had, that emotional impact was there where they saw it. They resonated with you. And conversely, sales that didn't occur, we didn't bring that desire into shape. And this, uh, at this point, I want to highlight whenever we have a misalignment of path, so step one, step two, step three is aid. Really, it stands for aid, attention, interest, desire. So we want to aid our client into making that agreement. But whenever we lose the path, so let's say I'm speaking to a client and I've and I'm at my point of where I'm creating interest about my product or services. And I find I've lost them. I don't go to desire now. I don't create a desire where they haven't even gained the interest. I go back to attention. I want to grab their attention again for whatever reason. Maybe, you know, maybe the pitch wasn't going well. Maybe I didn't make that uh, connection really well. Maybe really I didn't do a good job creating that attention and I jumped to getting their interest. And because I didn't grab their attention really well, I'm not getting the interest. So whenever we find there's some misalignment and you feel it, you know, you feel it when number of people that are in a call and the business that you're in, when you're speaking to prospects, you feel there's something off. I haven't got their interest. I really shouldn't start pitching my idea. I should go back to attention. I should go back to the interest. So these are all step by step. And before we go to the next step, we need to make sure that it's accomplished. So we've accomplished attaining their attention. We've gained their interest. We've gained their desire. And then we move forward. Step four is really creating that action, asking for the sale. A lot of times we do such a great job in the first three, creating that aid, attention, interest, and desire that we don't ask. We simply don't ask, okay, what card would you like to put that on? Here's a form. Here's a contract. Here's a dotted line. I've, ha I've taken the liberty of filling the form out for you. Just here's the X, please sign. How many, how often do we do that? Not often. Step five is the results. Prospect, no. Once they've signed out, we let them know that they're a client now. And it's our responsibility as a salesman to be of service to them. This involves continuous communicating. How many of us do we constantly communicate to our, to our clients after the sale is made? I know a number of salespeople that have, I've bought many things. I may not hear from them for like two, three months. But you know what? That's the worst thing. Why? Here's number six, service. When we give service to them, what is a client going to do? A client's going to continue to bring report with you, and they're going to continue providing business to you. You know, at the beginning, Roger, I forget the gentleman's name, but Roger was uh, speaking to someone about connecting them together, right? What is he doing? He's building rapport, building great service. Obviously that person has great service and Rogers knows it. So he's bringing that rapport. And this is step six of the process. So here's, let's take a quick look at the sales breakdown. Whenever we have a breakdown, when there is a need, so we've established that there is a need and the means are there. So they have the funds and we don't make the sale. It's always one person that really didn't do a good job. And it's just simply us. We are not good enough yet. We need to go back and practice our sales. We need to go back and practice our questions. Is it the right questions I'm forming for my product or services? We have not really effectively executed that. And I was watching uh, Seinfeld the other day and they were interviewing him. And he said, he practices every single day. I mean, I don't know how many times this man's been on, <laughs> on stage, but he still practices every day. And one of the, my biggest, biggest recommendation is, do you practice every day your sales pitch? Um, I frankly try. I try to practice every day. I'm probably at four or five times a week. And I sincerely ask that everyone on the call today, practice, practice your sales pitch every single day. Hey, Vend. 
Ashok wants to know what's the difference between step five and six. Okay, so step five is truly just the results asset, whereas step six, you're continually providing service. So when we say service, I'm, I'm talking about, do you know your client's birthdays? Another level of service that a lot of people don't do. Are you still in touch with them after six months, eight months, a year, two years? That's continued service for another year or two years coming. So number five is just within the vicinity, call it a week or two later perhaps by the sale. You're continuously providing um, uh, uh, continuity. Because what also what happens, a great question, I forgot to mention this, right after great step four and five, there's that buyer's remorse that kicks in. And we need to ensure the client that they've done the right thing by signing with us. And step four and step five, step five concludes that. We give them that reassurance, communicating after a week or so, checking in. Hey, going back to my example, Jeff, I'm just checking in. I just want to make sure you were able to uh, get everything you, uh, you asked for. Did you uh, find all the resources I forwarded to you? Do you have any questions? Do you have any comment? So it's just a week or two. And number six is beyond. We never end. Why? Because once we finish providing service, that person will go to another market. They'll go to our competitors. And whenever, the, I hope that answers the question, Ashok. Yes. You're welcome. So whenever a sale starts to break down, we should immediately review. And I mentioned this, we need to go back and review the sales process, discover where we got off track, shift gears a little bit, and go back to our questions. And there's a fine art of doing that. It's not as easy of just shifting gears and going back. But of course, as we practice, practice more, we realize how we can go back through the steps. If we're in step three, and I feel I still haven't really created that desire, go back to step two. And again, those forming those questions that we can be able to ma uh, manage that. Use the information you've gathered. And what we do is we try to, you know, you've gathered a lot of this information. Now you've been possibly speaking to this client now for 20, 25 minutes, and you've gathered a lot of information. You know a lot about this person now than you did just half an hour ago. So you gathered this information and it's gonna be a much more smooth transition now than instead of breaking the ice right at the beginning, right? So it's not gonna be as the same as before. So use all this information to navigate through those uh, three to six steps. I ask, you know, review your activity or past month, then lists a few of those presentations where the sale didn't come through. And if you find that there's a means or a need that was there, then I would suggest go back and try to implement these strategies that we talking about today and see if you can formulate and make a sale. So to be able to shape our future, we need to have, we have the willing and able to change our paradigm. And it's so important, this paradigm. I want to go back to it. And that's why I specifically put this here is I really want to stress on the paradigm. It is not, it was, it has been planted in there and it's in our mindset for years. We've been nurturing this paradigm and it's there from our genes, like I mentioned, and it's been there since our environment and it's been growing and we have been feeding this paradigm about our thinking and our subconscious mind, and it's not that readily easy to change it. So whenever the paradigm stays in control, nothing changes. And, you know, make a decision, make a decision today that you are going to make that quantum leap in your results. And again, I don't want to impress you, but I want to impress upon you that what I've done works and it can work for you. Regardless if we're selling a $200 entry level, item or a six, seven, $10,000 high ticket item. This strategy works. And you can create the, the economy for yourself. And let's go back to again, talking about 2008 financial crisis. There are more people making more millionaires and really achieving the great life that they wanted, making the sales that they wanted than ever before. Why? I personally believe it was about their mindset. The mindset that they had was different than others and they thought differently. So I want to thank you for your time. If you have any other questions or comments, let me know. No further questions. No, okay, well, I appreciate everyone's time. Should we go, uh, should I jump into our uh, offer there? Uh, yep. Yeah, okay. 
So in appreciation for you listening to me today, I want to be give back. And the way I'm giving back, and I'm providing a 30-minute consulting session. And we're going to go and develop a questionnaire strategy for your product and services. And on top of that, you know, Path to Agreement is, a, is the program itself that I'll be helping you with throughout that 30 minute consult. I'm gonna take you through that strategy. And on top of that, I'm gonna actually be giving you uh, two um, downloadable books as well. One of them is by my mentor, Bob Proctor, You Were Born Rich. It's an absolute must read. And another one is I highly recommend this book. Again, once you get on the 30 minute consulting session, I will provide a downloadable copy of this book for you as well. And it's called How I Raised Myself from Failure to Success in Selling. It is an absolute read for anyone that's in sales. It's by Frank, uh, Frank Beggar, and it is truly life-changing. And it just, the mindset shift is incredible when you read that book. And I'll be providing you a Hannibal downloadable copy of that as well. So what I'd like you to do today is go on your messages. Send me a message that, yes, you are wanting to change. You want to learn more on how to really create that pitch. Have that questionnaire for yourself. Maybe once you send me a text, the fact that you do want to and you want to create the sales and impact that you want to have in your life, I'm going to send you my calendar and let's sit down and talk for half an hour, an hour, whatever it takes, and let's create that system for yourself. If you're interested, like I said, send me a text message and I'll send you my calendar and uh, you can book a half an hour session with me and we can go into more details of this six-step process and formulate a plan specific for your product and service. Thank you, everyone. Hey, then, on uh, behalf of the uh, behalf of us all, and uh, behalf of the seventy-five thousand other members of EIN, uh, thank you very, very much for sharing this uh, fresh perspective on the whole sales process. Uh, I have never, I, I, I guess, I've been a salesman all my life, but I've never actually heard of the shifting of a paradigm as being a method to open the door to considerably uh, elevated uh, sales. So yeah. I thank you for sharing that point of view uh, with us. Thank you, Roger, for having me. It's been a pleasure. It's, well, our pleasure too. Could you please uh, um, stop share? Yeah. Are there any final questions for Payvand? We'll give it a few seconds. If none appear on the chat, we'll move into the rest of our agenda. Hey, Van, it looks oh, like nice. you've wowed us with your wisdom to such a degree that you left us all speechless. There are no <laughs> further questions. So uh, once again, I thank you very, very much.